When I was young, I went to a public high school in New Jersey that was known for the fact that they spent more money on football helmets than they spent on textbooks. Um, it's changed since then, uh, but I didn't come up thinking I was going to be a scientist. Um, I didn't build a robot until I was 21 years old. And I started off thinking, well, first I thought I was going to be a singing veterinarian. That was when I was three. Uh, after that, I wanted to be a firefighter. When I got to college, though, I would sort of decided that I was going to study kids. I wanted to be a developmental psychologist because I was fascinated by how it is that children are able to learn and the amazing range of things that we're able to do so quickly as infants. And so I did my undergraduate degree and I studied with some wonderful people and I studied kids and I was all set to go and do that. And then I met a guy who built robots. And we had a fantastic conversation that lasted for five years. And throughout that time, we talked about how we could possibly build robots that were like kids, that could learn as fast as kids, that could do the kind of fantastic range of things that kids could do. And after that five-year conversation, I suddenly found I was a computer scientist. And I was studying kids still, but I was building robots. And that's what I do today. So today I'm going to talk about this range of projects that we're working on right now to try to build interesting technology for kids. In the world of robotics, we've had assistive technology for about 40 years. And most of that has been in the form of these physically assistive devices. If you have a stroke, if you have damage to your brain that makes it difficult for you to walk, one of the therapies that you can use is this robot therapy, where they put you in this sort of almost power suit like thing that helps you to move your legs before you're actually able to. And these devices help people to regain the ability to walk. That's the kind of assistive technology that we've been building for years. It helps you to physically move through some kind of therapy. Today though, in the last four or five years, we've started talking about a different kind of assistive technology where we try to help people, not physically, but socially. And we build robots that look very different. They're often cute and fuzzy and furry. They're designed for kids. They're small and they sit on a little table. And rather than helping you to physically move, they try to do the same thing that a good coach or a good teacher will do. That is, they try to motivate you. They try to help guide you toward a particular goal. And they try to entertain along the way. That's what I'm going to talk about today. So we'll go through a couple of steps at the beginning. How do you make a robot social? And why do we use robots? Why not use something on a touch screen, a, a virtual character? And then I'll show you some of the results that we get. We've done a lot of work with kids with autism, and we're working right now with first graders and second graders, and I'll show you some of the work with that. So the first question is, how do you make a robot social? How do you get a robot to be something that people want to talk to and interact with? Aren't robots just dumb machines? And that turns out to be really easy, because we see the world as if it is social. I can show you this video that I stole from my friend and colleague, Brian Scholl, that's based on a 1944 psychology experiment, where you see these three little triangles move around on the screen. And you have no trouble seeing the story. You know which two of them were friends, and you know who was the bully, and you know who got frustrated, and who was angry at the end. And all I've shown you are triangles moving around on a screen. When you look at the world, 
your first instinct is to interpret it as if it is social. We do this with everything. All right, adults fess up. How many of you have secret names for your cars? Yeah, okay. Why do you give your car a name? It's not a person. We do this all the time. It's natural for us. We do the same thing with robots. And so one of the things that we study is, what are the kinds of things that cue people to do that? What are the things that trigger you to say, this is a, something I can talk to, something I can interact with, rather than, this is a refrigerator. <laughs> I wouldn't talk to my refrigerator. Sometimes that comes from very simple motion cues. And I'm going to show you first a study that was done by a high school intern from Amity. I saw a bunch of Amity people here working in my lab over the summer. And it used this little yellow robot named Keepon. And Keepon can move around on the desk. And we made videos of three Keepons. And I'm going to ask you to do the same thing that we asked people in this study. I'm going to ask you which robot is the best dancer? Baby. So, A, B, or C, which one is the best dancer? says A, the one on this side was the best dancer? Nobody ever likes A. <laughs> Who says B, the one in the middle was the best dancer? Most of you. How many say C was the best dancer? Okay. What was the difference between them? What was the difference? Yeah, so one of them was completely in sync with the music, the one in the middle. One of them was completely out of sync, the one over here. Nobody liked him. And one of them was on the beat half the time and in the offbeat half the time. Whenever we ask this question, the universal response is the one in the middle is the best dancer. He keeps time with the beat. But when we ask the question, which one of them is the most human-like dancer, <laughs> everyone says C. Because C is the one that seems to make a mistake and then correct itself. You guys want to do one more? Yeah. All right. Which one's the best dancer, A, B, or C? You like A? <laughs> All right. <laughs> See? Why? Why? Okay. Now. <laughs> Before you answer my question, do you see how easy it is to make something social? Yeah. It's actually really easy. Just that motion can do it. All right, which one is the best dancer? Who says A? Who says B? Who says C? Now it's a little more split. The difference between them is in the number of sort of dance moves that they have. A has a repertoire of about five moves. B has a repertoire of about seven. And C has a repertoire of about 10. 
And when we, we've asked thousands of people this question, and most of them prefer B. Once they get too much complexity, people don't like it as much. <laughs> they like to see a little repetition in their dance. So we know that we can make things look social just by the way they move. And we know we can get people to respond to them. But we have another way of doing this as well. We can do this from a very high level, very cognitive kind of effect. So in this experiment, we use this little humanoid, it's about this tall, named Nico. And we ask people to come in and sit down in front of Nico and play rock, paper, scissors. Everybody knows how to play rock, paper, scissors, right? Yeah, okay. Rochambeau, rock, paper, scissors, okay. The first group that we invited in, they played 20 minutes with the robot. And the robot played rock, paper, scissors, and every time it would look down and it would say either, I win, or you win, or we tied. And it was the world's most boring experiment ever. And at the end, yes, we had an incredibly bored group of undergraduates. <laughs> Because 20 minutes of rock, paper, scissors is incredibly boring. <laughs> now the second group, they came in and they played 20 boring minutes. And then something interesting happened. The robot would throw a gesture, would lose, but it would look down and it would say, I win. <laughs> And people treated it as if it were some kind of broken toaster. <laughs> Something terrible had gone wrong. And here's some of their responses. They were confused. What? <laughs> they were surprised. But the robot was still a big toaster. They didn't talk to it. They didn't want to engage it. They, they were still bored. It was unusual, but it was still boring. The last group had the most interesting time. They played 20 boring minutes. And then the robot would throw a gesture and lose. And it would look down and change its gesture <laughs> and say, I win. And now watch their responses. So now all of a sudden, it wasn't a toaster anymore. Now it was a dirty, rotten cheater. <laughs> we made them play 20 more minutes after that. The boring first group played 20 minutes and they hated us because it was still boring. The second group that treated it like a broken toaster, they played 20 more minutes and it was still 20 boring minutes. And this last group played 20 minutes and they sat on their edge of their seats and they watched to make sure that that cheating robot didn't do this thing again. <laughs> and they talked to it. They suddenly, after 20 minutes with this thing, they started talking to it. When they talked to us later about it, they used active verbs rather than passive verbs. They anthropomorphized the robot. They talked about it as if it were a person because of that one thing that it did. Sometimes we can turn things into social creatures just by these little changes. Okay. So that brings us to a question. We can make things social. We know we can get people to respond to these robots as if they're people. But why do we use robots? Robots are really tough. Why don't we use a nice character on a screen? We could put a little virtual character on your phone or on an iPad. Why don't we do that? 
because the robots are more expensive. They're difficult to produce. It means we've got to do maintenance on them. They're fragile. They're easier to break. They're harder to customize. Why use a real robot? If I want to help kids learn, why use a real thing? And the answer comes from two different places. The first part is, we know that that physical body matters because it changes how willing you are to listen to the robot. So here's a study we did. We had people come in and sit in my office. And we told them that they were going to do some office tasks for us. Half of them sat next to the real robot, Nico, the, the robot you just saw. And half of them sat next to that same robot, but on a big flat screen TV, doing a two-way video conference. In both cases, they knew the robot could see them, and they could see the robot. The robot would follow them around as they moved around, would wave to them when they walked in. We asked them to proofread a document and file some stuff and a bunch of other stuff that didn't matter. And then we asked them to do the important thing. We said, we need you to put some books away in the office. The robot knows where the books go. <coughs> and then the robot would point to a pile of textbooks and point to a location on a shelf. And everybody was willing to go and take the books and put them on the shelf, whether they sat next to the real robot or the virtual robot. And then the robot did the one trick question. It pointed to this nice big pile of textbooks. And then it pointed to the trash can. <laughs> How many people were willing to take this pile of textbooks off of my desk <laughs> and throw them in the trash can because the robot said so? <laughs> Would you do it? Yeah. It's hard to know until you're really there. The people who sat next to the real robot, two-thirds of them, the line in blue, two-thirds of them picked up the books, walked over to the trash can, put them in the trash can, turned around like nothing strange had happened and said, what's next? <laughs> Only about 18%, one in, less than one in five people who sat next to the robot on the screen picked up the books and threw them away. They all knew what the robot wanted. They all picked up the books. They all walked over to the trash can. They then tried to negotiate with the robot. <laughs> Are you sure you want me to put these over here? And the robot just pointed to the trash can. <laughs> Some of them tried to be sneaky, they hid the books behind the trash can. <laughs> or they balanced the books on a shelf near the trash can. Somebody pulled a table over and put the books on a table near the trash can. <laughs> One woman put the books on the floor and put the trash can on top of the books to see if she could fool the robot. <laughs> but they really didn't want to throw away those books. So why, when they're sitting next to the real robot, did they do this? And the answer is that when we're there in person, we're more compelling. We've known this in business for hundreds of years. If you want to sell someone something, you go and you visit them in person. That's why we had door-to-door -door salesmen. That's why even today, if you have a big business deal, you go and visit your client. You don't call them. You don't Skype with them. Being there in person makes people more willing to listen to you. The second answer is that we learn better in person. We tried to come up with a task that was just purely cognitive. It was just about thought power. And so we gave people a logic puzzle. This is a logic puzzle called nonograms. And in this puzzle, you have to sort of start with a blank field and then fill in some of the squares according to a set of constraints on the rows and a set of constraints on the columns. And so, for example, this bottom row here says six and then one. And in the finished puzzle, you have to have six consecutive filled in squares, and then some number of blank squares, and then one filled in square by itself. But you have to do this 
so that it matches not only the constraints here, but also the constraints on each of the columns. Now for this bottom row, it's easy. There's only one way I can put six and then a space and then one in this row of eight. But for this first column, I've got one and then two and then one. And so there's a lot of different ways I can do that. As you learn to solve these puzzles, there are tricks that you learn. For example, I can look at this and I can tell that there's only one way to fill this in. And so regardless of what the columns say, I know exactly what that bottom row needs to be. I can then use that to start figuring out other things. So we ask people to come in and, and solve these puzzles. And we put them in five different groups. One group we said, you're on your own, good luck, here's four puzzles, go solve them. We taught them the rules, we taught everybody the rules of how to do them, but then we said, you're on your own, go ahead. A second group sat at the laptop, solved these problems, but every once in a while they got a little hint. This voice would play from the speakers on the laptop and would give them a hint about how to solve these puzzles. The third, fourth, and fifth group got those same hints, but some of them got them from a little video of the Keep On robot on their screen, and some of them got them from the real robot sitting there next to the screen. We gave them four puzzles to solve, only we played a trick on them. Because we gave them the first puzzle, and the second puzzle, and the third puzzle, and then for the fourth puzzle, we gave them the same puzzle that they had on the first one. Only we took it and we rotated it 90 degrees. So nobody figured out that we actually gave them the same puzzle. But it was the same puzzle, so it was exactly as hard. And we did that so that we could measure how much they had learned about how to solve these puzzles. And if you solve these puzzles with no hints at all, you get better. The first puzzle takes you about 15 minutes to solve. The fourth puzzle takes you about 13 minutes to solve. If you get some of our hints, if you get them from the speakers coming out of the laptop, or you get them from the video of the robot, you do better. The lessons help. But if you get those same lessons from the physical robot sitting there next to you, you solve those puzzles about five minutes faster. Now, these people over here, they got the same information, the same hints, the same lessons as these other folks did. Only they got it from someone in person. Why do we respond like that? Why does that physical presence being there make us learn better? We don't know exactly why, but it does. This is why going to class is a good idea. <laughs> when you're physically there, you learn more. If you're just watching it on a screen, you don't learn as much. So go to class. It's a good thing. The robots say so. OK. So I want to be able to tell you a little bit about what we do with this information. We know that we can build social robots. And we know that we can make those robots compelling. That is, we can make you do the things that the robots ask. And so we've been trying to put this to good use. Our first set of projects dealt with kids with autism. Autism is a deficit that 10 years ago when we started this work, I had to explain a lot about what autism is. No one knew what it was. The incidence rate was about one in every 500 kids. Today the CDC says it's one in 50 kids in the US will be diagnosed with autism. That's a 10-year change, a factor of 10. That's unbelievable in a way. Now, there's lots of reasons that that's happened. There's been changes in the diagnostic criteria, changes in awareness. But today, almost everybody has a sense of what autism is. It's a social deficit. It's also a deficit where we see a wide range of abilities. And it's something that there is no cure for. So we've been looking at ways in which we can use these robots to help kids with autism. We do this because there have been a whole wide variety 
of robots worldwide from, well, let's see, everywhere from uh, Canada to Japan, uh, Switzerland, Korea, the US, the UK, uh, just about anywhere you can think of. Roboticists have been putting robots with kids with autism and they've been seeing some phenomenal things occur. The first thing they see is that the kids get highly motivated. And this is no surprise at all. I gave a child a cool new robot toy. Look, they're excited. That's not news. We also see that the kids get this sort of long-term engagement with the robot. Again, I gave a child who has a tendency to perseverate on things, who has a tendency to do the same thing over and over again. I gave him a cool robot toy and he kept playing with it for a long time. That's not news. But what we sometimes see is we see these kids suddenly start to display social behavior that we don't typically see them using when they're with the robot rather than when they're with people. So we've been doing, in collaboration with the Yale Child Study Center, a number of long-term studies on how robots can be useful in therapy. And we've been using this little dinosaur robot called Pleo. And Pleo was a commercial product. The company no longer exists, unfortunately, but they were nice enough to give us access to all the internals. So we reprogrammed them. And we reprogrammed them so that they could respond to an infrared remote. And so we would secretly hit buttons on the remote and the robot would do things. And we took the remote and we taped it to the bottom of a clipboard and hit it. And we'd push buttons secretly to control the robot. And no one would ever tell that we actually had this. They all thought it was coming directly from the robot. And so we took kids, nine to 12 year olds, who were high functioning. These were kids who were verbal. They could talk, but they had clear social deficits. And we tried to engage in one of the standard therapies that they do. Now, a lot of these kids have problems with what's called vocal prosody. And that's not the words you say. It's not what you say, but it's how you say it. So we can tell, tell the difference between when I say, you did a great job. And when I say, you did a great job, and I said the same words, but they meant two different things. That tone in your voice has meaning. And for many kids with autism, they have problems both producing that kind of variation and recognizing it. And so we gave them what is a standard therapy session for them. Only rather than using a human with it, we used a robot. We brought in the Pleo robot and we told them, Pleo is afraid of water. And we had the robot walk across this little play mat. And as the robot walked across the play mat, it would come up to these rivers. And when it got to the river, it would look down and it would start to shake and it would sound scared. And the child's job was to say something that sounds encouraging. They all knew the right words to say. You can do it, Pleo. But a lot of them had trouble saying it in a convincing tone of voice. And so they practiced this with the robot. Now, we did this with for, the, for only five minutes with the kids. So we weren't really expecting them in five minutes to suddenly be able to learn this skill. But what I want to show you is the change in the children before they saw the robot and after they saw the robot. We talked to them for a little while before they saw the robot and after they saw the robot. And I'm going to show you one typical 11-year-old, rather typical for this study. He's a child who has real difficulties. So you're going to see how he acts before the robot comes out and then when the robot comes out and then after the robot has gone away. And I want you to look for the difference before and after. So here he is beforehand. Notice he doesn't look at us. He doesn't make eye contact. He's not even facing us. He's 
echolalic, he repeats what we say, he's not really engaged in the conversation. And then the robot comes out. And now he's smiling, he's engaged. He's trying really hard to sound encouraging. You'll see him in a second glance over to the woman in the brown shirt. Right there. That's something we hardly ever see him do. That's a behavior called social referencing. There he does it again. And here he is afterwards. He's not facing us, but he's making reasonable eye contact. He's engaged in the conversation. He's asking questions. And this is with five minutes. Our clinical therapist friends like to say that we are the best warm-up act ever. <laughs> this kind of change, this kind of attentiveness, this, this kind of engagement for this child is very rare. And we don't often see it. And that's what makes us excited about this, this idea that we can make a real difference here. Now, we've tried to say, is it the robot? Is it the robot itself that really makes this difference? And so we did another study where we tried to compare interactions with an adult, with interactions with a robot, and interactions with another piece of technology. And we did this the summer before the first iPads came out. And so a tablet was an extremely interesting new device. Nobody had really seen one before. And so we had kids come in, and over the course of a day, they played three block building games. One with an adult, one with a robot, the little dinosaur Pleo, and one on a tablet. We wanted to have a case that was social, but that they had seen before. It wasn't novel. That was the adult. A case that was both social and novel, the robot. And something that was novel, something they'd never done before, but that wasn't social. And that was the tablet. And we randomized the order of this, and we did all of the good things that a scientist should do to make sure that we don't have any artifacts in this data. And we looked at how the kids responded in these different conditions. I'll give you an example. So here's one child with autism who is looking at three different interactions. Uh, here he is first interacting with an adult. He's supposed to play this game with the woman in blue. And he's not really interested in playing with her. That's typical for him. Here he is playing the same game a little while later with the dinosaur robot. He's excited, he's engaged. And here he is playing with the tablet. And parents, this should be an absolutely familiar behavior for all of you. <laughs> he's basically silent. And when he does ask us questions, it's about the robot that he saw a few hours ago. Okay. So we looked at how much do the kids talk in these different conditions. And sure enough, they talk the most when the robot's there. They talk the least when the tablet is there. We expected that. But we tried to say, well, is it, why are they talking more when the robot is there? Is it that they're just talking to the robot? And so we analyzed it to say, who are they talking to? Are they, when they're playing a game with a partner, how much do they talk to that partner? And it turns out they talk to the woman in blue as much as they talk to the robot. The difference was, when they had the robot there, they spent more time talking to that other woman, the woman in the brown sweater, than in any of the other conditions. The robot made them engage more socially with another person than they did when we had a person there or a piece of novel technology. So we think that the robots can really do something here. We think that we have a great way to study this. 
But we had a problem. All of our robots were designed to do these short little five minute or 30 minute interactions. But we needed to be able to do this over a period of weeks. And that meant being able to build a different kind of robot. One that could change over time. One that could adapt to the child. And that was a real challenge for us. You know that somebody who tells the same joke every day, the joke isn't funny anymore. The robot that does the same thing every day, it's not interesting anymore. So we started thinking about how to build robots that really do help kids. Not just kids with autism, but all kids. And we were lucky enough to get this wonderful support from the National Science Foundation to work with this great team of people to think about how to build robots that can be a long-term coach, that can change about what kind of information, what kinds of lessons it's giving you as you learn new things that can be personalized to you, that can change as you change, that can adapt to the kinds of strengths and weaknesses and the kinds of things that motivate you. And we've been trying to build those and I'll show you the first set. So we have this great group of partners that we work with and our first attempt was this little robot we call the dragon bot and it's about this big and it sits on the table and the dragon bot talks to you and we use this robot for a bunch of different things but the one I'm going to show you about today we've been using the robot with first graders to teach nutrition everything that we know about nutrition says that the sooner you can get people to have good habits the easier it's going to be. And so we're targeting first graders, kids who don't get to make choices about what they eat. And we're trying to teach them something about how to make healthy choices. And so with this robot, we've had this robot in schools both on the West Coast and in summer programs here on the East Coast, trying to teach nutrition to first graders. Okay. And so they go in with the robot for about 15 minutes for each session and we give them six sessions over the course of two or three weeks. And through those six sessions they get to meet the robot. The robot's name is Chili. And Chili has a story. Chili desperately wants to win the big dragon race. And this is the first year that Chili has been old enough to race. Now Chili's sister, she's older and she won the last couple of years. And Chili really wants to win this year. And he's found out that if you eat the right things, you'll be faster in the race. And so the kids have a job. They have to help Chili pack his lunch and decide what chili should eat. Now chili eats foods that humans eat. Chili doesn't eat special dragon food. And so they choose things that they would like chili to have for his dragon lunch. And we talk to them about the kinds of choices that they can make. Should chili take water or juice or milk? What kinds of things should chili be packing? And the kids find this interesting and exciting. And when we're done at the end, Chili sends them a little postcard saying how well he did in the race. And I want to show you a couple of kids and the way that they interact with this robot. So here's one girl who's picked out milk for the robot. And in a second you'll hear Chili respond. And so we're asking them to make choices. We're giving them some information about what healthier choices are, but it's up to them to make them. 
I want you to watch this girl's response to show you just how engaged she is. We never get the kids to look away during these sessions. And finally, again, the same girl a couple of weeks later. And so we've been in classrooms doing this with kindergarten, or sorry, with first graders, and trying to see how much we can actually do with them. Now our first question was, are they still going to find the robot interesting? And after three weeks, the kids are just as happy and just as interested and just as engaged as they were on the first day. But most importantly, the things we find them asking about and the things we find them saying changes over that three week period. In the beginning, they give very short, curt answers to the robot. Or at best, they expand a little bit on what they were talking about. And by the end, after three weeks, they're sometimes giving those short answers, but they're sometimes talking about the foods that they ate at home or at school. They're relating the things that they've talked about with the robot to their life. And that's exactly what we want to happen. Now we've been doing this with all sorts of different robots. We have robots going out into schools to do English language learning for kids from uh, homes that speak primarily Spanish and Portuguese. We have robots that are going out to look at uh, kids with uh, severe behavioral disorders, adolescents. We have robots that are going to be built to, do, uh, to go back into our autism classrooms and do more work there. And so we've been doing this with a lot of different places. And every place that we look at, we see basically the same kind of thing. The robot is a fantastic motivational tool. And it's a way for us to provide one-on-one -on -one support when we don't have enough time and people to do that with each child. So I want to say thanks first to a whole crowd of people that make this work possible including a whole lot of undergrads and some of our high school interns. Um, many of the pieces that you saw early on were designed by undergraduates or by our high school students. And so the, le the sort of last thing I want to be able to say to you is, this is stuff that you can be doing. This is stuff that with a very small amount of experience, you can be doing stuff that no one's ever done before. And that's incredibly exciting in the world of science. So if you want to find out more, uh, our websites are up here. Those are the best places to look. Yes, we do look for high school interns, and there's instructions on the website of how to do that. And thank you guys very much for your attention. Um, I hope you enjoyed it.